learning. It's always our pleasure coming your way. And we trust that you're learning so much on this channel. It is the best channel that you can have in Ghana and Africa. We hope to go international very soon. It's my pleasure coming your way tonight with the History Live Show. I am your tutor, Albert Kingsley Brain. It always a joy learning on joy learning. Now tonight we're going to have discussion on one of the topics that you treated in first year on the civilization of East African coast, that is the Swahili civilization. And I trust you are ready. Get your paper, your pen, your notebooks, invite friends from all over, tell them Joy Learning is live and it is history night and we're treating the civilization of East African coast. So let's quickly go through what we'll be doing tonight, like I told you earlier, we are looking at the Swahili civilization of East African coast. And we would want to briefly go through our objectives. What are the objectives for tonight's lessons? And these are the following objectives, or these are the objectives we hope to achieve. By the end of the lesson, we trust that the student will be able to, one, explain how the Swahili civilization was created. Otherwise, we want to know the origin of the Swahili civilization. So stay with us. We would make sure we go through that. And by the end of the lesson, we hope that the student will be able to outline the main features of the Swahili civilization, the main features. And by that, we'll be looking at the various characteristics of course, if we say that Swahili had civilization, what are the features or what are the characteristics that we would use as evidence to show that indeed they had attained some level of civilization? Again, we would want to, by the end of the lesson, help the student to be able to account for the economic activities of the Swahili between the 13th and 15th centuries. Of course, between 13th and 15th centuries, because that was the period where the Swahili civilization was at its peak. And so we should be able to outline or discuss the various economic activities that were undertaken by the people of East African coast. We would also do well that by the end of the lesson again, student will be able to describe the social and political organization of Swahili. By that, we'll be looking at socially how were they organized, how did they relate with each other, and also we look at their political organization in terms of management of the territory, who was responsible for what, and how did they go about doing it. So I believe at this point, you are ready. But before we go into the Swahili civilization, which happens to be our main topic for tonight, I want us to have a little teaser before we go to today's topic. And the teaser is a simple question. And the question is, why is it important to study history? Yes, have you asked yourself? Or I know probably sometimes your friends do ask you, so why are you studying history? Yes, we need to let the public appreciate why we study history. And that is the teaser for tonight's revision show. So what is the importance or why is it important that we study history? There are times people think that History as a subject is just about studying dates, you know, memorizing the names of people and maybe places. But truth is, history as a subject, as we study it, is more than memorizing the names of people or memorizing dates. Yes, here in history, we believe that if people or if an individual does not know where he is coming from, he cannot appreciate where he is and cannot forecast 
or make predictions into what the future holds for him. So history is important because in the subject history, we seek to review the past. You can write this thing down, that history as a subject, as we study it, we seek to review the past, okay? Now, as we review the past, we get a better understanding of the present. So why has society become what it is today? And we can only understand why society has become what it is today if we are able to review our past. I know you remember your definition of history. The fact that we study important human past or important past event. And we are saying that we study the past or review the past because reviewing the past helps us to understand the present. Now, once we understand the present, now we can go ahead to predict or make predictions into, or it will give us indications better still into the future. So trust me, if you study history, you're doing a great thing or a great job. But specifically, we want to outline some importance of studying history. Now, the first reason for which we study history and possibly we teach history is the fact that history instills patriotism. It instills a sense of patriotism in students. Yes, it instills a sense of patriotism in the sense, so our emphasis is on the word patriotism. One would ask, what is patriotism? Patriotism has to do with the love that one has for his or her nation to the point that he or she is willing and ready to die for the country. So the love that one has for his or her country that moves him or her to the point of laying his or her life down for that country. Now we're saying that it's important to study history because history instills patriotism, a sense of patriotism. What do we mean by this? Now, as we study history, History helps us to appreciate or understand the various activities of various nationalists. And by nationalists, we're talking about people who stood and undertook various activities for the liberation of their nations. Once we look at the various activities, the sacrifices, the risk that individuals in the past took in order to defend their country, and to some extent, lay down their lives for the country. The student who is studying this comes to appreciate what it means to give yourself for your country, sacrifice your life for your country, just for the betterment of your country. Yes. So how would Ghana have been if some of the patriots and the heroes of our land had not rigged laying their lives down. So let's take the history of Ghana or the independence of Ghana. We know there are some key individuals who laid their lives down. So mention can be made, of course, of the first president of Ghana in the presence, in the person, I mean, of Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, or Sajifo Dr. Kwame Nkrumah. Yes, he's one of the patriots that we can talk about. We can talk about Dr. J.B. Dankwa. We can talk up about Akwaje. And by that, I'm going into the big six, you remember. Now, mention can equally be made of some women, such as Ya Asantewa. You know the story of Ya Asantewa and the Asante British War. How a woman stood that she was not going to allow the foreign authority exercise control or bring Asante under their control. As students study the history of their people, it goes a long way to help them by this, as they appreciate people who laid their lives down. 
it also instills in them the desire and the willingness for them to also do something for their nation, to defend their nation, and to see to it that their nation develops. And that's what we mean by that the study of history instills a sense of discipline in the student. All right, let's take another importance or another important reason for which we study history as a subject. Whoa. So we say that the study of history helps to avoid past mistakes. Yes, and don't forget that this is a teaser for tonight's revision. We need to remind ourselves, we need to let the world know why we study history. And once we are done with that, we go into the main topic for today. So the teaser again, as you can see on your screens, is why is it important to study history? And the first point, we said it instills a sense of patriotism in the student. Now, the second importance is that the study of history also helps to avoid past mistakes. It helps us to avoid past mistakes. Yes. Now, as we review our past, we look critically at some of the decisions and steps that were taken by some people, be it political leaders, be it social leaders, be it economic activities that were done in the past. And then we look at where we went wrong and how it affected us negatively. So once we're able to study or review the past and study important events that happened in the past, we are able to fish out the part or the steps that were taken in the past that did not help us. That probably did not allow us to reach the level that we love to reach. For instance, let's take Africa. If you look at Africa, we say that our development seemed to be lacking behind or we have a slow pace of development. And politically, most of these things have been cited back to the numerous coup d'etats that took place in Africa. The various military interventions that took place in Africa that toppled various governments. Now let's look at even Ghana. After our independence, we know in 1966, the first coup d'etat took place by the NLC, where the first republic was overthrown. Then we entered into the Second Republic under Dr. K. Buzia. And then again, in 72, there was another coup d'etat or military intervention. And we know very well that whenever there is military intervention or overthrow of government by the military, it affects our developmental progress. In the sense that military government usually does not or do not continue with most of the policies or the investments that are undertaken by the various government that overthrew. So, looking at our past, this teaches us that the best way to develop our nation is not through the barrel of the gun. The best way to change a government is not through the barrel of the gun, but rather through the ballot box. And that is what we mean by the study of history helps to avoid past mistakes. Looking at how we have suffered in development or how our developmental process has been slowed down by military interventions, we would say, or we can say that it is not profitable or it will not be our, in our best interest to undertake a military intervention as a way of changing government. All right. Let's look at another important reason for studying history. Still on our teaser. It is also important to study history because the study of history imparts ethical values. It imparts ethical values. What do we mean by that? Now, the study of history 
impart ethical value in the sense that as we study history and the cultures of various people, we are able to pick some valuable lessons in their lifestyle, in their culture. We are able to appreciate the fact that if we value what we have, if we are able to stick to our ethical values, that is what will help us maintain our identity. So we study and we get to know that in the past, children accord the elderly so much respect. I have heard most elderly people say that in time past, when a child met an elderly person who carried goods or a bag or any load, it was normal for the child to help the elderly. But it seems same cannot be said of our generation. So we say that the study of history teaches us ethical values in the sense that once we study about our past, we are able to bring back those valuable ethics that helps our society to be unique in terms of morals. And that helps us to be able to live lives that are worthy of emulation. Now, getting to study these ethical values also helps us to eschew behaviors that are disgraceful. So be able to do away with behaviors that bring disgrace, but rather copy and learn ethical values from the culture of the people that we study about. And that is another importance for the study of history. Let's look at another point for which we study history. Yes, so in case your friends are asking you, why are you reading history? Why history? You tell them that apart from the fact that history teaches us valuable lessons or ethical values, apart from the fact that history helps us to avoid past mistakes, apart from the fact that history instills in us a sense of patriotism, he, the study of history also has some economic value. What is the economic value? The study of history can help an individual to be employed. Yes, if you study history to a higher level, you could use that as a means to get employed. And what do we mean by that? Now, once an individual studies history to a high level, probably to the tertiary level, for instance, you can end up becoming a history tutor, and that will be a source of livelihood for you. Of course, history teachers get paid. Yes, that's our job. So once you study history to a higher level, you can become a teacher, you can become a lecturer, that is if you want to teach in the tertiary institution. Now you can also become a consultant. Yes, people can come to you for you to help them to review the past and get essential information about their past. Definitely, you not do that for free. There is a token that will come to you as you do that. Now, apart from you being a consultant, if you study history to a high level, you could equally become an author of history books. And once you are offering history books, definitely you do that for commercial purpose. You sell them and you are likely to make some money or livelihood out of that. You can equally become a lawyer, you can become a politician, and so the study of history has various prospects. It helps you to gain employment in various areas. Now let me tell you, I had some of my students who studied law in the university. And usually in their first year, I had two of them call me and telling me how the history they did in SHS is relevant or has helped them in some of the courses that they were doing in the tertiary, especially during their first year in the university. And these were students studying law. So if you are studying history, please be confident about it. Be proud you are studying history. And whenever people ask you, 
Why is it important to study history? Please be quick to tell them that there are various benefits for studying history. So that will be it for our teaser for tonight revision. Hmm. And I trust you've learned so much. All right. So at this point, we'll be entering into the main topic for tonight revision show. As I said earlier, we are looking at the civilization of East African coast, that is Swahili. We are looking at the Swahili civilization. And I told you earlier as part of our objectives that we'll be looking at the emergence of Swahili kingdom. We want to go on a quick break and we will be right back so we can delve into details about the emergence of the Swahili civilization. See you in a moment. All right. Now we want to continue. We'll take our break in a while. We want to look at the We want to Um, the multimedia group launched an educare fund okay, to help brilliant but needy students um, as, as part of our CSR uh, activities um, to see them through school. Uh, we thought that we should be able to extend the support beyond um, the educare fund. of the free SHS, um, the question then was whether there will still be that value in providing for students at the SHS level, especially given that SHS was going to be free. So if that money isn't going into supporting individual students, then there should be another way of still investing to benefit such students. The management and board of the Educare Fund decided to invest in a project that creates more access to educational content for students wherever they live. So we looked around and uh, we spoke to Wolo. And then we spoke to our partners at SES, a satellite platform that Multi TV is on. And they decided that look, it's a good cause, we'll give you satellite bandwidth. We spoke to KNET, who then provided the ground services to put us on the satellite. And so this uh, match, then the three, the three partners, Platmos, Media, then began to put the plan together. And then in December 2019, we launched. Started as a telecommunication service provider, but is uh, gradually uh, stepping up its um, operations and services to support this nation with its um, uh, capacity. Uh, so uh, there was already uh, a plan by KNET to provide support for open university kind of. Uh, learning system or platform because uh, others, other nations do it. You realize that up until recently when the universities have been very innovative and have uh, uh, instituted certain programs, uh, weekend programs, uh, vacation programs and things that are providing opportunities for people who cannot find physical space in the institutions to learn. And, uh, so when multimedia uh, came up with uh, the same dream, it was like uh, 
incidence of uh, two mines. So we supported the cause because we knew that this nation will not have enough space physically uh, to uh, provide the learning opportunities required by uh, our people. SES is a global leader in content connectivity uh, solutions uh, provision. We have over 70 satellites uh, worldwide providing uh, video services and network services uh, to billions of uh, users and consumers uh, in, in the world. Multimedia Group has been a partner of SES for, for many years. Uh, when the um, SHS uh, double track system started, uh, multi TV and um, his partners they approached us and they wanted to do something about getting these students who are at home whilst others are in school something to do. So we thought, why not use our platform, the, the SES multi TV platform, to uh, provide an education channel for these kids who are home to at least be able to catch up uh, yeah, and be able to do something. Right. Now, this multi TV platform reaches more than, let's say, 65% of homes in Ghana. So if you take any, every, every three homes, two homes are watching Monty TV. So we knew that this platform will, will enable us to reach a lot of these kids at home. Initially, when the project started, it was set up for senior high school students. But later, COVID struck and the project needed to expand to include the junior high school students also. But after two years of operation, we expanded and we have included um, students at the basic, the primary level. So on a normal day, you have lessons from, for basic school, also the primary school level, junior high school level, and the senior high school level. Hello and welcome back from that break. We want to continue from our discussion where we left it before we went on the break. So we introduced our topic, that is the civilization of East African coast, Swahili. And we first want to know or look at how the civilization of East African coast came about. And that is the emergence of Swahili kingdom or the rise of Swahili kingdom. Now, the word Swahili or the name Swahili has its origin in an Arabic word which is called Sahil or from an Arabic word termed Sahil. This word Sahil translate or means coast. Yes, so Swahili, remember the name Swahili originated from an Arabic word, Sahil, which means coast. However, the name Swahili literally means people of the coast or coast dwellers. People of the coast or coast dwellers. Now, we'll delve into details later on how the name came about, but let me just give you a gist. Now, we're saying that it has its source in an Arabic word, Sahil. And we're saying that it means people of the coast or coast settlers or dwellers. Why Arabic? Arabic because it was given to them by some Arabic traders that had come from Southern Arabia who had come to trade with them. Now, when they came, when the traders came, they settled along the coast of East Africa, the coastline of East Africa. And their settlements along the coastline of East Africa served as a magnet, which drew the people of Bantu, or the indigenous people from the inland, or the inland settlement. It attract, attracted them to come and settle at the coast. So as the people started coming from the hinterland, 
of the inland of the settlement to settle at the coast, the Arab traders referred to them as Swahili, meaning people of the coast. And that is how the name came about. Now, the people of Swahili speak the language Ki Swahili. Ki Swahili. Ki Swahili, we are told, is a Bantu language that has borrowed vocabularies from the Arabic language. So it is basically a Bantu language that has been enriched or has borrowed words or vocabulary from the Arabic language, as well as, to a lesser extent, some vocabularies from Persia or the Persian language. So whenever we talk of Kiswahili as a language, we are talking about a Bantu language that has been enriched or that has borrowed vocabularies from the Arabic language to a large extent and to a lesser extent from the Persian language and the Portuguese language. Now we are told that Kiswahili is the most widely spoken African language in the East African territory, talking about both the East African coast as well as the southern part of Africa. It is the most widely spoken African language across the East African territory. And we are told that in modern times, Tanzania has adopted the Kiswahili language as their national language. So in modern times in Tanzania, when you go to Tanzania, Kiswahili is their national language, otherwise spoken as a lingua franca. We'll talk more about this as we progress in the lesson. Now, we're told that the Swahili civilization grew as a result of a peaceful integration. A peaceful integration between different cultures. And the cultures are the Arabic culture, Persian culture, and the Bantu. Yes. So the Bantu were the indigenous settlers along the Somali area or the Somali coast. And we are told that the Arabs and the Persians were attracted to the Somali settlement where the indigenous Bantu people were settling as a result of their interest in the trade in aromatics. So trade in aromatics. Okay, aromatics and incense. Now, aromatics we are told are a sharp, pleasant smelling plant substance. It's a sharp smelling, pl pleasant plant substance that is used for religious purpose and also used in the preparation of perfumes. Now, it was this aromatics and the incense that attracted traders to the Somali coast. So we say that trade was one of the forces for the rise of the Swahili civilization. In the sense that as this trade in aromatics and incense was going on, it attracted traders from South Arabia, that is the Arab traders, as well as traders from Persia and traders from India, as well as traders from China. And to some extent, we are even told that some Portuguese were attracted to the trade that was taking place along the Somali coast. Now, we are told that these traders who had come from the Arab territory referred to the territory, that is, they referred 
to the central territory or the main central region of East African coast as the Zanj. So let's look at the map here. Now you can see Somalia here. I trust you can see from the board. Okay, so we can see Somalia here. So the central part is looking at from Somali here down to the island of Pemba or the Pemba Island. They referred to this, this territory as the Zanj. Now, in this area when they came, as we have established already, that trade was the major thing that attracted them. They traded in these aromatics as well as in incense. And I told you that the aromatics were sharp smelling plant substance that were used for religious purpose as well as for the preparation of perfumes as well as the incense. These were needed in India and in China for their religious purpose. So it attracted these people to come and settle along the Somali coast. And we are told that some of the traders moved south as far as to the Sofala coast. And they referred to the central part, as I've said earlier, the central part between the Somali coast and the Pemba Island as the Zanj. Now let's also establish that some of the items of trade that attracted these traders included ivory. Ivory, yes. The Chinese and the Indian people especially were so much interested in the soft ivory that were brought from the inland of East African coast, the inland settlement of East African coast, because they used it for several important items. So apart from ivory, we are also told that they were interested in gold. Now gold abounded around the Sofala coast. You know, the Sofala is to the north of Zimbabwe, and Zimbabwe abounded in gold. You know, Zimbabwe is part of the Bantu settlement, yes. So these original or indigenous Bantu settlers were mining gold, or gold was in abundance in this area. And this gold attracted traders from the Arab world, as well as from the Persian civilization or the Persian cultures, and some traders from India and China, as we have said earlier. Now, they were equally interested in items such as slaves. Slaves. They also wanted to get slaves to, you know, undertake their various economic activities. And slaves were an important economic items that were used in other territories. All right. Now, they were also interested in coconuts. Yes, coconuts abounded in these areas. And so the traders were interested in some of the items. Now, as the trade increased, it attracted more people to come from the Southern Arabia, especially Muslim Arabs. So they kept coming. And as the trade was growing, the settlement started expanding. So we can say that trade in the Somali area is one of the factors that contributed to the rise or the emergence of the Swahili civilization. Now, we can equally talk about the religious conflict in the Muslim world. The religious conflict in the Muslim world. As more and more Muslims were moving to the Somali coast, we are told that during the period or the period after the movement of 
the prophet Muhammad from Mecca to Medina. Thereafter, there were some conflict in the Muslim world. So some of the Muslims, in an attempt to seek refuge, fled from Saudi Arabia. And as they fled, they came to settle at the Somali area, or the place that has been referred to as the Zanj. So let's take note that apart from trade that attracted people from Arabia and the Persia, there were other people or Muslims who were running away from the conflict in the Muslim world. And as they fled South Arabia, they came to settle in the Zanj. We saw in the map, that is the central region or the central part of the territory from Somali to the Pemba Island. And these people, as they kept fleeing from Saudi Arabia, they also came to settle at the territory around the Zanj. Now, when the traders came to settle around the Zanj, or sometimes they refer to it as the Banad coast. They refer, the Arabs refer to the Somali coast as Banad coast. As these traders from Persia, from Saudi Arabia, as well as from China, from India, and to some extent even Indonesia, came to settle in this area, we are told that they intermarried with the local Somali women. So intermarriage can also be looked at as one of the factors that contributed to the emergence of the Swahili kingdom. The traders from Arab, from Persia, as well as people who were fleeing from conflict in the Muslim world, who had come to settle along the Zanj or the Banadir coast, intermarried with the native or local Somali women. And by the 10th century, we are told that a new culture emerged, and it is this new culture that laid the foundation for the civilization of East African coast. So, let's look at it. Intermarriage between traders from Arab, as well as traders from Persia, and then the Bantu. Don't forget, by the Bantu, we are looking at the local Somali women. So the intermarriage of these three groups or cultures gave birth to a new culture. Now, the Persians from the city of Shiraz brought a culture known as the Shiraz culture. Their culture was known as the Shiraz culture. As the intermarriage took place between the Arabs, between the Persians, between the Bantu or the local Somali women, we had a new culture which became known as the Shirazi. The Shirazi civilization or the Shirazi culture. Pardon me, I trust you can see. So it was the fusion of different cultures such as the Bantu culture, the Arab culture, the Shiraz culture from Persia, that laid the foundation for the civilization of East African coast. So I believe that 
if you are asked about some of the things or to talk about factors that brought about the rise or the emergence of East African coast civilization, you'll be in a better position to talk about that. Don't forget that it is a civilization that emerged from intermarriage of different cultures. Also remember that these different cultures got to the Somali coast as a result of one trade because the people or the Arab traders who came to the Somali coast were interested in trade items such as the aromatics, the incense, they wanted ivory, they wanted gold, they wanted coconuts, they wanted slaves. And it is the desire to get these things that brought them there. As well as people or Muslims who were fleeing from the conflict in the Muslim world. And it was these people who came together to intermarry, to lay the foundation of the East African coast. Now, the civilization kept growing, or more Muslims kept trooping to this settlement because of the good relations that they had established with the Somali people. Now, we are told that when the Muslim traders settled along the Somali coast or the Zanj area, they put up a good behavior or good attitude. And their good behavior or attitude allowed the local rulers, that's the Bantu rulers, to receive them. Now, because they put up good behavior, we are told that it is that good behavior that they put up that ensured a good interrelationship between themselves and the local settlers. So we can say that because these Muslim travelers who came to the Somali coast put up good behavior, they were received warmly by the local traders. And so a good interrelationship between the local people as well as the Muslim traders and the Persian traders also helped to ensure the emergence or the rise of the civilization of East African coast. All right, now let's quickly go into looking at some specific characteristics, some specific characteristics of the East African coast civilization. So we are now looking at the features or the characteristics of the Swahili civilization. And one key feature of the Swahili civilization is the language, the language of the Swahili. Do you remember the name of their language? We said it earlier. The Swahili people or the Swahili civilization birthed a new language, or it brought about a new language, which is referred to as the Ki Swahili language. Now, Ki Swahili language, as it was developed, it became a lingua franca for East African coast. What it means is that it became the most spoken of the accepted national language for the people of East African coast. By that, what we mean is that apart from their distinct ethnic languages that they spoke, the Kiswahili language became an inter-ethnic language. What it means is that it did not belong to any particular ethnic language. So please pay attention again. We are saying that one key characteristic of the 
civilization of East African coast or the Swahili is the development of their language. Their language we are referring to as the Ki Swahili language. Now, we have established earlier that the Ki Swahili language became a lingua franca for East African coast, meaning that it was the most widely spoken language across the East African territory, both the coastline as well as the southern territory. Now, if you remember, we said earlier on that the Kiswahili language as we speak now in modern times has been adopted as the national language of the people of Tanzania. Now, we're also saying that it became the second language of all the people in East African coast. And by that, it means that apart from their indigenous ethnic language, it became the second language for everyone. Now, let's take Ghana, for instance. So we're using Ghana as an example. Now, you realize that in Ghana, we speak various ethnic language or languages. I mean, we have the Akan language, we have the Ga, we have the Ewe, we have the Northern Territory with their diverse languages. But beside or apart from the specific ethnic languages spoken by the various ethnic groups in Ghana, almost every ethnic group generally speaks the English language. So what it means is that probably you may not speak my ethnic language or you may not be able to understand my ethnic language, but you understand English language. So English language to somewhat is the lingua franca of Ghana or the second language we all speak aside our ethnic language. And I'm sure you know that English language does not belong to any specific ethnic group in Ghana. That is exactly how Kiswahili is to the people of East Africa. Apart from the specific ethnic languages that they speak, the Kiswahili language is spoken as the second language. And so we say that it is an inter-ethnic language for the people of East African coast because it did not belong to any particular ethnic group. Now, Kiswahili, we are saying, is basically a Bantu language. Please take notice of that. Emphasis on the word basically. So it was basically a Bantu language. But because the Swahili civilization came as a result of fusion between different cultures, we are told that the, this Bantu language was developed, or the key Swahili language was developed by adding, to a large extent, some Arabic language to the Bantu language, as well as borrowing some vocabularies from Persian language and to a lesser extent, some Portuguese language and others. So key Swahili language is a mixture of Bantu language with borrowed words or vocabularies from the Arabic, the Persian, Portuguese, amongst others. So whenever you are talking about the key Swahili language, remember that it is a Bantu language that was developed by borrowing, to a large extent, vocabularies or words from the Arabic language, as well as the Persian language and the Portuguese language. Now, the key Swahili became a written language. It was it was developed into a written language in East Africa. Now, the written language had more borrowed Arabic vocabulary. That's the written language. Now, it was important to them because some traditional stories or chronicles of East Africa was written in the Swahili language. 
it helped the people to be able to document some important or chronicles, I beg your pardon, to be able to chronicle some important national history of East Africa. So the development of the Kiswahili language was critical to the civilization of East African coast. All right. Apart from the language, we also want to look at another feature or another characteristic of the Kiswahili language. I beg your pardon, of the civilization of Swahili. I think the key Swahili language seemed to have captured my thoughts. I like the language. Yes, it is spoken widely across the East African coast. But we now want to look at a different feature. And that feature is the Africanization of the Swahili culture. Africanization of the Swahili culture. Now, if you remember, we have stated earlier that the Swahili culture was a, a mixture or a fusion of the culture of Persians, known as the Shiraz culture, as well as that of the Arabs, as well as that of the local Bantu people. But we are saying that it became known as the Shirazi culture after the Shiraz culture of city of Persia. So you get it. The culture was known, the new culture that laid the foundation for the rise of East African coast was known as the Shirazi culture. The fact that it was known as Shirazi culture tells you that to a large extent, it was dominated by the culture of the Persians and the Arabs, and less of the local people. However, as time went by, this culture, the Swahili culture, was Africanized. And we are saying that that's another important feature. And this was made possible as a result of the increasing intermarriage between the Arabs between the Persians as well as the Bantu. As the intermarriage increased, more and more of the culture of the Swahili was Africanized. We are told that the one sultan, the sultan of Kiwa, dad inherited the kingdom of Kiwa. So usually their leaders or their kings are referred to as sultans. Sultan of Kiwa, by name Ali ben Salimani, Ali ben Salimani, we are told that he married the daughter of a Bantu king from whom he took over power. So let me write his name. One sultan by name Ali. Let me do it well. Okay, so, so you, you get a better view of it. That's why I want to write it well for you. So we are saying that one sultan or king who was a Muslim, he was a Muslim uh, Arab, he married the daughter of a Bantu king. Now his name is Ali ben Seli. Mani. Ali ben Selimani. He married the daughter of a Bantu king or ruler. Now, he as an Arab 
marrying the daughter of a Bantu ruler, what it means is that their son is now half Bantu and half Arab. Otherwise, half African, half Arab. Do you get it? Now, as this intermarriage went on, more and more of the population became of African descent because of the intermarriage between the Arabs, Persians, and the local Somali women. Now, the Africanization of the population or the culture of Swahili also affected their religion. It affected their religion. How? Now, initially, the Arab Muslim or the Muslim Arabs and the Muslim Persians who came introduced Islam to the people. And with the introduction of Islam, it was not just the religion, but also the culture and tradition of Islam. That is the hadith. The hadith of Islam, the culture and the tradition as well as their customs were handed over or introduced to the Swahili society. The various Islamic ceremonies were equally introduced to their people. And so the people accepted the Islamic worship, not only in the religious practice, but also as a way of life in their customs and in observing the various tradition or the hadith of Islam. However, we are told that as the population through intermarriage became Africanized, most of the coastal dwellers returned to their African traditional worship. They returned to their African traditional worship. Yeah. So we have here, as the Swahili population became more and more Africanized, the practice of African religious beliefs and forms of worship increased. Now, what were the African forms of worship? You know, Africans believe in the worship or they worship nature gods. Yes, gods that dwell in nature. Talk about rivers, talk about mountains, talk about trees, talk about animals. The fact that the African traditional religion believed that God dwelt in nature and they worshipped them. Now, apart from their belief in nature gods or gods that dwelt in nature, they also believed in the existence of witches. You get it? Yes, I mean in Ghana, we are Africans and we believe in the existence of witches. They also believed in the existence of evil spirit. And these are African traditional religious beliefs or practices. So we are saying that as the civilization of East African coast or Swahili was Africanized, most of the people at the Somali coast or the coastal line moved from the Islamic practices in order to return to their African traditional practices, which includes the belief and worship of nature gods. That's gods that dwell in nature. We're talking about the smaller gods, okay? Yeah. And we have just said that they also believed in the existence of evil spirit as well as the existence of witches. And so as the civilization of Swahili was Africanized, it also affected their religious practices. 
we are told that it was only the Muslim rulers or the sultans who continued to preserve or to keep their Islamic practices. But for most of the settlers along the coast, they took to the worship of nature gods as well as the belief in witchcraft and evil spirit. All right. So we are done with looking at the Africanization of the Swahili culture as a second feature or as one of the features of the Swahili civilization. We now want to look at another important feature of the Swahili civilization, and that has to do with the political organization of Swahili civilization. By that, we are interested in knowing how the people were organized politically, how were they ruled, and by what system were they ruled. So let's quickly look at the political organization of the Swahili civilization. All right. Now, we are told that one important feature of the political organization of the people of East African coast is that they had a centralized system of government. The people of East African coast, or the Swahili, had a centralized political system or a centralized system of government. Now, what is a centralized system of government? I know you remember by definition that whenever we're talking about centralized government, we're talking about where power is vested in an individual. A political government or system where power is vested in an individual. And so we are told by one Muslim, one Arab traveler and scholar by name Al Masudi. Al Masudi. Now, Al Masudi was an Arab, a Muslim scholar and traveler. He said that as at the period 10th century BC, the whole of Zanj, and if you remember, we said Zanj refers to the territory or the central regions along from the Somali coast through to the Pemba Island. He says that as at the period 10th century, when he visited Kewa, he saw that the territory of Zanj coast was under the rule of one king. So that's an evidence to show that politically, the people of East African coast or the Swahili civilization practiced a centralized system of government where power was vested in one person, in this case, the king. Now, the king was expected to rule according to the traditions of the people. Now, by that, what we mean is that the king is supposed to rule with all fairness. So, the king is supposed to rule according to the traditions of the people. Now, he was supposed to rule with fairness. Please note it down. So he's supposed to rule according to the traditions, the lay down or accepted traditions of the people. And he's also supposed to be fair in all his dealings with the people. Now, we are told that if at any point in time, the king of East African coast, if at any point in time became tyrannical or wicked in his rule, or if he was cited to have been partial 
in his judgment or in rendering justice, the king would be put to death. Yes. So in that centralized system, the king in whom power was vested was supposed to rule with fairness. He was supposed to rule with the traditions of the people. And if at any point in time he was seen to be partial in the administration of justice, or if he was seen as tyrannical or wicked, he could be put to death. And that is to help us understand that in the political system of Swahili or the people of East African coast, it was a centralized system that had checks and balances. I hope you understand. So even though power is vested in one person, the king could not rule according to his whims and caprices. He could not rule as he wanted or as an autocratic leader. There were checks and balances to ensure that this king ruled according to lay down tradition and that he was fair in the administration of his government. So that's a key feature of the political organization of the people of East African coast, that is the Swahili people. Now let us also remember that there was a transformation of the political society into city states. Transformation of political society into city states. Okay. Now, you realize that though the whole of Zanj is under one ruler, the territory was divided into various towns and cities. And Al Masudi once again said that as at the 10th century, there were about 40 cities or towns under the Zanj ruler. Indirectly, we can say that within the centralized system, in order to ensure effective administration of the territory, the territory was divided into various city-states. And that's uh, another important feature of the political organization of the people of East African coast. So the entire territory or the whole of the Zanj territory is under one ruler. And yet, in order to ensure effective rule, this territory has been divided into city states with various leaders appointed to be responsible for these city states. And we have said that Al Masudi, who was an Arab traveler and scholar, he said that as at the 10th century, he could count about 40 towns or cities under the Zanj ruler. Now, the various governors who were appointed to rule these states were also supposed to rule according to the traditions and the laid down rules of the people of Swahili. I hope you understand. Or should I give you another example? Let's look at Ghana. You see, Ghana is one nation. I just want you to understand. So I'm using the case of Ghana to help you better understand what we mean by the transformation of the political society into city-states. You know, Ghana is one nation. We are practicing a centralized system. Power is vested in one gentleman, in this case, in the person of the president. Yes. Yet, in order for the president to effectively rule the entire nation, realize that Ghana has been divided into 16 administrative regions. Yes, with various regional ministers. Uh-huh. So these regional ministers are responsible for the specific regions and is accountable to the president. In that same way, the Swahili people, though they are practicing centralized system, where there is one king who is in charge over the entire Zanj territory, the territory was divided into city-states. 
And Al Masudi could count about 40 of them. And each of the state had a governor or a leader who was accountable to the Zanj ruler. And the governor of the various state was also supposed to rule according to the laid down rules. All right. So that is another important feature of the political organization of the people of East African coast. So we have just said that most of the towns, most of these towns also existed independently under the rule of their own Muslim sultans. That is it. So they are in charge of the city states where they have been placed and they report to the Zanj ruler. All right. So that is it about the political organization of Swahili civilization. Now let's look at another feature, the luxurious lifestyle of kings. We are told that the kings or the sultans of Swahili dressed in expensive and luxurious dresses. They dressed in fine linen clothes and they were adorned also with gold ornaments. Yes. So silk linen robes were the dresses that they wore. They wore silk linen robes and they were adorned with gold ornaments as well as silver ornaments. And they lived a luxurious life. We're told that this luxurious lifestyle of the rulers or the sultans of the cities in East African coast or the Zanj was imitated by their followers. The followers also sought to copy and also dress in that expensive clothes as they saw their sultans or their kings dress. And that is another important feature of the political organization of the people of East African coast. I trust you are learning a lot and we are also remembering some of the things we discussed in first year. I know what C is around the corner. Who knows? If you have a question on the civilization of East African coast or Swahili, you are advantaged because through joy learning, you are going through or you're revising the topic again for a better understanding. And as we always do here at Joy Learning, we seek to help you excel academically and ultimately in your WASI so that you can graduate and move on to the tertiary institution. Another important feature of the civilization of East African coast or the Swahili has to do with their social organization. And by social organization, we are interested in how they were organized socially. How they were organized socially. Now we're told that socially or in the Swahili civilization, they had three main social classes. Yes. So there was existence of social classes. Now these social classes were grouped or developed according to the social status of the people according to the social status of the people. So let's look at it. It, it. it looks like a ladder, a ladder or a hierarchy where, you know, arranged from top to down. We have three main classes. Now we have at the top of the ladder, if you like. So let me draw a ladder here. This is a social ladder. So the first class
the first class in the society of Swahili had to do with the ruling class. The ruling class. As well as the various royals or sultans. So the Islamic or the Muslim Arab sultans or rulers were the people who belonged to the first class. They were at the top of the social ladder. They were usually people who were in charge of various territories and ruled the various territories. Now, some people have said that they included the merchant. They included the merchant, the rich merchant or wealthy merchants. They also were part of the ruling class. And these people were the first class society, or they belonged to the first class society within the Swahili civilization. Now let's look at the second class. So please remember that the first class includes the ruling class as well as the wealthy merchants. Wealthy merchants. And they were mostly Muslims. Muslims sultans and Muslim traders or merchants who were wealthy. Now the second class, the second class has to do with artisans or freeborns. That is citizens or members of the society who were free. They were not slaves or they were not pawn held by any group of people. They were people who could live their normal class. So it's more like they don't belong to the ruling class. They live, I don't want to use the word ordinary, but they are the regular citizens, if you like. We're using the regular citizens because at the bottom of the ladder or the people who occupied the bottom of the ladder, who in this case are the third class, has to do with the slaves and pawns. Slaves and pawns. So in between the third class and the first class is the second class. We are saying that they are the citizens or members of the society who are not slaves, who could go about doing their normal businesses and live their regular life. They usually were artisans or interpreters or clerks, you know, those who assisted the ruling class in the daily running of their ruling activities or governance. Now let's look at the third class, or the bottom of the ladder. At the bottom of the ladder, we have slaves and pawns. Slaves were usually people who were held as assets or properties by other people. So what it means is that they did not have their freedom. They were assets or properties of other people who used them to undertake various activities of their choice. Now, most of these slaves were Africans or people from the native territories who were used for farming activities. They were usually used for labor activities, used on the farms predominantly. So they do the farming to feed the society as well as the ruling class. Now the pawns are people who were used as collateral, you know, to acquire loans or when people owed others. The pawns were given out to serve in the society to defray the debt of their owners. So for instance, if a man, let's say Uncle Kwesi, is owing Uncle Kwame. Uncle Kwesi cannot pay the debt. 
So Uncle Kwesi would release a son of his to Uncle Kwame so that the child goes to serve Uncle Kwame for a period of time until the debt is defrayed. So you are saying that at the bottom or the lower class, we have the slaves and the pawns. And these were the various classes that existed in the Swahili society. So always remember that there were different classes headed by the ruling class, the aristocrats, the sultans, the wealthy Muslim merchants. And then we had at the bottom of the second class, those artisans, those freeborns, those clerks, and people who played various roles to assist the ruling class. And then at the bottom were the slaves. All right. So still on the social organization, we are told that the Swahili civilization was an urban civilization. It was an urban civilization. What it means is that they had built beautiful cities. Now, one Muslim traveler, Ibn Battuta, yeah, who traveled to Kilwa. Now, Kilwa was one of the cities. You can see from the map, when we, drew, we showed you the map, we had Kilwa, we have Pemba, as well as other cities. Now, he went, he traveled to Kilwa around 1503. Now, he said that Kilwa was one of the most beautiful cities he had ever visited. Visited, I beg your pardon. Now, we're saying that Swahili civilization was an urban one. Most of these cities were built with tall, magnificent buildings, with well-laid streets and public facilities that made the cities very beautiful. So Ibn Battuta is talking about the fact that Kilwa, as he visited, was one of the beautiful cities he had ever visited as of the period 1503. And was saying that around this period, the population of the place could number up to about 10,000. So you realize that there were several urban centers or urban settlements found in the Swahili civilization. And by that, we're talking about beautiful cities with magnificent buildings, beautiful buildings with well-laid streets, and high populations, populations as high as 10,000, as reported by Ibn Battuta, who was a Muslim traveler and scholar who visited the city of Kewa in the year 1503. And he reports that it was one of the beautiful cities. So we can say that the civilization or socially, the territories of East African coast or Swahili were organized as urban cities or urban centers. And that is crucial or that is important for us as historians to take notice of. All right, we would make progress still on the features of the Swahili civilization or the characteristics of the Swahili civilization. Now, if you look at it critically so far, we have looked at their political system, which we said was centralized. We said it was divided into cities. We have spoken about the fact that the kings lived in luxury. We have also spoken about the fact that the various towns and cities were independent or autonomous, some level of autonomous, 
on the way they manage their territories. And then we've spoken about the development of the Kiswahili language as another feature. If you remember, we have spoken about the fact that the Swahili civilization was Africanized. That's the Africanization of the Swahili civilization. We have looked at their social organization and we now want to look at their economic activities. There is no way we will look at a civilization of any territory or any group of people without looking at their source of livelihood or what activities they were involved in economically. So let's look at the economic activities of the Swahili people. See the basis of the economy. Agriculture forms the basis of the Swahili civilization. Now, even though agriculture was the basis or formed the basis of the Swahili civilization, we are told that their agriculture was more of subsistence than of commercial. So let me repeat that again. Economically, agriculture formed the basis of the Swahili economy. However, agriculture in the Swahili economy was more subsistence than commercial. By subsistence, what we mean is that they grew their crops or they farmed to feed domestic needs or domestic population. They did not grow food crops for commercial purpose, but they grew them for indigenous consumption. Now, some Arabic travelers and scholars have said that the people of East African coast, all the Swahili people, are great gardeners rather than farmers. So for them, they believe that they developed various gardens. So they grew just to feed the domestic needs of their people. So we refer to them as great gardeners because they did not do agriculture on commercial basis. They did it on subsistence level just to feed the domestic needs. Now they grew various vegetables. They grew vegetables. We are told that they also grew various citrus. We can talk of oranges. We can talk of lemon. And then again, they also grew bananas. Amongst other vegetables. So they usually grew fruits and vegetables. Now we are told that banana formed a major part of the staple of the people of East African coast. Bananas formed a major part of the staple. Now they ate banana with fish. So let me put it right. Bananas and fish formed a major staple of the people of East African coast. Yes. And this, we are told, that attracted people from all over to also come and settle in the East African coast settlement. Now, let's look at another economic activities of the East African coast people, apart from the fact that they grew food or vegetables and others to feed their population. We are told that another key economic activity of the East African coast people was trade. Trade. Okay. 
So trade was both internal and external. Now, if you remember, trade was one of the factors that led to the rise of the East African coast civilization. And trade, we are talking about they trading with people such as the Arabs. I trust by now you've written that, that down already. We're talking about the Persians. We're talking about the Indians. We're talking about the Chinese. As at the 8th century AD, they had already established trade relations with these people. Now, we are told that the people of East African coast were great people and they played a role of middlemen or as middlemen. The role they played as middlemen brought them great wealth. So with the internal and external trade, we are looking at they getting import and export duties from the various items that were exported. If you remember, we said that ivory was one important trade item that was taken from the inland of East African coast because it was needed in India and China, which was used for a form of palanquin which they produced there because the ivory from East African coast, that's the inland territory, was soft and they liked it. We also talked about the fact that they were interested in getting gold as well as slaves. These trade items were taken out of East African coast and in exchange they received various cloth, beads, and other trade items from these Indians and Chinese as well as the Arab traders. So we would Take a break here on the economic activity of the people of East African coast. And we'll take a break, take water, sip some water. We would be right back. Just believe in yourself, and even if you don't, pretend you do, and at some point, you will. Examination malpractice is a no-no. My name is Tina, and I am your examination coach. Here are some practices you must avoid when taking an exam. Let's talk about the don't. One, don't get stuck on a question. If you get a particularly hard question, don't sit there panicking about it. The best thing you can do is to have a quick think about it, mark it with a highlighter, and move on to another question. Two, do not arrive late in the examination hall. Abiding by the time during exams is extremely important. Reach the venue at least 20 minutes prior to the time. Three, avoid studying late at night. Studying for hours at night can affect your sleep cycle negatively. According to studies, Studying in the daytime is more beneficial and effective than late night studies. 4. Engage in group studies. Friends can be beneficial for you during your preparations. You can explain topics in which you are good to your friends and your friends can do the same for you. Synergic studies can boost preparation and confidence to another level. 5. Students are not to change their seats with others. One must always make sure not to sit at a place which does not correspond to their index number or where he or she has been assigned to sit. Six, do not carry mobile phone, smartwatch, or unauthorized electronic device to the exams room. Seven, never start writing the answers until the invigilator tells you to do so. Eight, do not write the examination for another person, neither should you allow someone to write your exams for you. 9. Do not take your answer booklet or question paper outside the examination hall during the examination. Alright, there you have it. Believe in yourself, prepare well and you will come out with flying colors. 
My name is Tina and I am your number one examination coach. Keep watching Joy Learning and follow us on all social media platforms. Till I come your way again, shine on. Joy Learning, keep learning. All right, welcome back from that break. I trust you've taken some water and you are taking some great notes as well. Now, we want to quickly look at our question of the day and then I'll announce the phone number of the phone numbers and you can call in to answer them as I continue with the lesson. So let's quickly look at our question of the day. Now today we are asking you, how did the traditional medicine men treat illness or treat illnesses and diseases in pre-colonial Ghana? The question of the day is, how did the traditional medicine men treat illnesses and diseases in pre-colonial Ghana? The phone numbers to call are, 030-221-1705. I take it again. 0302-211-705. You can also call on 0302-211-706 to give your answers to the question of the day. And I read the question of the day for the last time and we go back to the discussion on Swahili. How did the traditional medicine men treat illnesses and disease in pre-colonial Ghana? Call in and give me your answers as we continue the lesson. So be reminded that you can call in. All right, so we have a caller on the line. Hello. Hello. Good evening. What's your name and where are you calling from? I'm Peter. Your name again? Peter. 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 Isa. Isa, where are you calling from? I'm Peter. Okay. So give me one of the methods that were used by traditional medicine men in pre colonial Ghana. Yes, they used concussion. Okay. Can you explain briefly in a minute or 30 seconds? Yeah, from what it has to do with um, uh, has, has, has to do with, um okay. let me see. Okay, thank you, Isa. Thank you very much. So Isa is saying that one of the methods that were used by the traditional <laughs> medicine men was the use of concoction. It's over here in my marking scheme very well done so what they did was that they take the roots of plants the back of trees or leaves boil and give to the person who is sick to drink that that's just one of the methods you can also call in 0302211705 0302211706 to give me another method that was used by traditional medicine men as we continue with the swahili civilization all right so before we went on the break, we were talking about the fact that agriculture formed the basis of the economy of Swahili. And we said another important economic activity of the East African coast was trade. And by trade, we're talking about internal trade, which had to do with trade amongst themselves, the various cities in East African coast, as well as the international trade that included trade with the people of India, the people of China, some European nations, the people of Arab, as well as the Persians. And we said before we went on the break that the people of East African coast, or the Swahili people, play the role of middle men. Let's look at another important feature of their economic activities. Now, we are told that most of the trade that took place, whether internally or externally, was undertaken predominantly 
on the basis of butter. So trade in East African coast took place predominantly by the use of the butter system. And by butter system of trade, we're talking about the exchange of goods for goods. The exchange of goods for goods. So traders from China, from India, from the Arab world, from Persia, brought various items to the Somali coast or the Zanj area or the territory they refer to as the Banadir coast. All right, we have another caller. Let's hear his or her question. Hello, good evening, and what's your name? My name is Abdul Ibrahim. Abdul Ibrahim, where are you calling from? I'm calling from Northern region, Zabzugu. Zabzugu. Yeah. That's good. All right, so kindly give us your answer for the question of the day. Yeah, the big colonial time, what did the medicine men do? Actually, they find the, the disease itself, uh -huh. and they use the traditional herbs to treat the disease. Yes, For example, that... when they find, like, a the headache that the person is having, okay. they have their own ways of getting the herbs, uh -huh. which they add all these types of herbs together to give it to the person to heal it. So actually, the first thing they have to do is they have to find which is the problem, what is the problem of their illness. Okay. And they can use the traditional help to find the smooth. Okay, so just give me a specific method. Somebody said the drinking of concoction, that is one. What specific method can you talk about? Um, okay. I heard you mention headache. How did they treat headache? Will you call okay. will you call again or you can okay. answer? Okay, okay, okay. Let me call it. You call again, right? All right. So um let me help him. He he made mention of headache. Now one of the methods that they used in healing headache had to do with what is known as smearing. Smearing. So for headache, for instance, they get their specific herbs, as our caller just said. They grind it and mix it into a pap. A pap. A pap is like a soft, you know, ointment kind of. All right, we have Charles on the line. Hello, Charles. Where are you calling us from? Please, I'm from Western North Region. Western North Region, specifically where? Seshi Adofua. Seshi Adofua. Good to hear from you. So give us your answer for the question of the day. They were treating illness through offering of sacrifices. Okay. Under what circumstance do they do that? What type of sicknesses demanded the offering of sacrifices? They had some beliefs that okay. some illness were caused by the, um, the gods. Okay. As a result of some bad behaviors of the people. Okay. So the victim were asked, by the um, those who are in charge of treating the animals to bring some sheep so that they will sacrifice it to the gods for them to forgive them their sin. Well done, Charles. That is a great attempt. Well done, well done. Keep listening. We may have a wonderful package for you as you keep watching Joy Learning. So Charles uh, just spoke. Thank you very much. You can also call in on 0302 211705 or 0302 to answer the question of the day. Charles spoke about the offering of sacrifice. So the people believe that, or the medicine men believe that some sicknesses were caused by spirit, be it gods, be it witches, or evil spirit. And for such sicknesses, they could not treat them with herbs or with roots of plants. And so they needed to divine. All right, Emmanuel, you welcome to the History Live Show. Where are you calling us from? I'm calling from Central Region. Where in Central Region? Where in Central Region? Yeah, where? Where? The, main, the specific area in Central Region. Yeah, I don't know. 
The question you asked. Okay, you answer your question. I'm, I'm all yes. How did the traditional medicine? How did the traditional medicine men treat illnesses and disease in pre-colonial Ghana? Yeah. Mhm. Mm so give me one yeah. method. Me, I don't understand. That's why I'm a court. Your line is not helping. Stand well and give your answer. I'm sure you get it right. You want me to get? Give me some. Give me one method. One method. That was used by the, the use of butter. The, the use, use of, of butter system of faith. No. Did you get the question well? Yeah. Uh, okay. 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 Uh -huh. I cannot develop. Uh huh. I was talking about under Swahili, but our question of the day is on traditional medicine men and how they treated diseases in pre-colonial Ghana. So you may have to call again. Okay. That's all right. Thank you very much for calling in. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Keep watching. All right. So we are back to what we're discussing. We said that the trade in Swahili was based on butter in the sense that they exchange goods for goods. Goods were brought from elsewhere and they exchanged them with goods in the Somali coast. Now, even though we are saying that predominantly trade was based on butter system, archaeological excavations have come across some coins. Archaeological excavation has come across some coins in the East African coast. And so, historians and some scholars have said that the use of money or the minting of coins would not have been a general means of trade. What it means is that the use of money and coins was the reserve, probably, according to scholars, for the ruling class. It wasn't everybody or the general public in East African coast that could use money to trade. For the general public, they were supposed to trade based on the butter system. However, the use of money and coins may have been the reserve of the sultans. Or, all right, we have another call. Hello, caller. Your name? All right. So we, 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 we would be wrapping up soon. Now, it was the reserve of sultans. It was the reserve of sultans or the ruling class. So kindly note, take note of that. Now we have few minutes to go. So let's remind ourselves again of our question of the day and you can call it. So the question is how did the traditional medicine men treat illnesses and disease in pre-colonial Ghana? And the number to call is 0302 211705. 0302211706. All right. So let's wrap up as we wait for our last caller for the day. And you'd be privileged to be our last caller for the day. We want to briefly look at the development of metal technology. As it is with every other civilization, the people of East Africa. All right, Emmanuel is back on the line. Hello, you. Emmanuel, uh, you are last caller. You can now give us your answer. Yeah, I want to ask, ask some questions, different, different questions. Oh, is, it, is it on what we are learning today? Yeah, not, not this one. Okay, so you ask your question. But I want to ask uh, every time the BBC, BBC questions on the BBC. Every time we will stop the meeting All right, so stay glued to your TV and keep watching Joy Learning. We'll be advertising the timetable for that so that you'll be able to. Okay, okay. Win. Okay, so keep watching Joy Learning. Okay, but and me, I'm, now I'm going to write my final exam. That's why I'm asking this question. Exactly, so we would advertise it for you. 
So okay. keep watching. You know when you would have the JHS session, okay? Okay. And wish you all the best in your exam, okay? Yeah, okay. Pass Thank well you. and come and join us. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. So we we're talking about the metal technology or development of metals. And we're saying that as it is with all other civilizations, the people of East African coast also learned how to use metals to develop their territories. We are told that the Sofali, the Sofala Mountains, I beg your pardon, the Sofala Mountains abounded in iron ore. It's abounded in iron ore. And they use these ions to produce various weapons. They use these ions to produce agricultural tools or inputs, as well as using it for various iron ornaments. And some travelers have confirmed that the people of East African coast were able to produce various ornaments from iron. Since the Sofala Mountains in the Sofala coast area abounded in iron ore. Iron ore is the natural resource for iron. Now they also were able to learn and develop copper technology. They produce various items with copper as well as with bronze. And we are told that the people of East African coast also learned to use silver to produce various ornaments as well as gold technology. However, it is believed that the gold technology might have been learned at a later time. We would want to end the discussion on the Swahili civilization tonight here as we've been able to look at the various components as we discussed earlier. We told you that we were going to discuss, or uh, by the end of the lesson, we told you that you should be able to explain how Swahili civilization was created. We've done that. We've also been able to explain the main features of the Swahili civilization. We have also been able to look at the economic activities of Swahili between 13th and 15th century. And by God's grace, we have also been able to describe the social and political organization of Swahili. It's always a pleasure coming your way. I've been your history tutor. Mr. Albert Kingsley Bray. And I trust that as you have followed us critically to this point, you are going to excel in your exam. Keep learning on joy learning. Until we come your way again, we say that enjoy the rest of the evening and see you again in our next lesson. Thank you and bye-bye.